happening. All right, so it is just just 7.03. Um, we're gonna do a little, let me, let me go into just a couple of things from last week that are worth like pulling up and looking at really quickly before we fully launch in, in case anybody's got some more time. One of the things that I added in, I, I realized that I wanted to add in more like timing and concrete details to the thing that we did last week. And so in here, I've got an actual time chart that waterfalls down. What's going on? Oh, I'm being called right now. Oh, we're all being called by New Haven. Um, so the, there's a waterfall chart. When you go to a website, you can actually get through a browser and see what that looks like. We're gonna talk a fair amount this week about hosting websites. And so as we do that, you're going to want to think a little bit about the safety of how you host a website. And so we're going to just briefly have this up here and look at safety. Mostly, we're going to talk today about local hosting a website. So how do you host a website in a way that makes it local and internal so that all of your people on your Wi-Fi network can get access to it. But then from there, uh, we'll be able to share it out and make sure that that it's just your local network and nobody out any further. And then we'll talk a little bit about how you can host a website completely start to finish in the cloud. And then the big thing is that you don't want to accidentally turn on port forwarding, but the good news is that that's an accident that's hard to make. So it's really not easy to just sort of push forward to, to port forward with, with just a couple of commands. It's something you have to set up on your router and it's not an easy thing that you can just accidentally flip on. So that's good. Um, but we're gonna use this as a foundation to talk a little bit more about things. Also, I posted a little video where I talked about the difference between Arduino and Raspberry Pi and like how those two relate are connected but not exactly the same. And that's probably worth checking out but it's a longer discussion than we than we should try and squeeze in here in the pre-class time. But basically, Arduino's good at like directly driving the hardware, but not good at internet. And Raspberry Pi is good at internet things, but not so much at the the like firing up motors and moving stuff. So we've got this interesting dynamic that goes between the two. But let's pop back over to here. We're gonna actually get started with class for this week. So we're gonna take everything that we did last week and we're going to be building on it for class this week where we're looking at the sort of nuts and bolts of how you get servers to do the things that servers do. And so we're going to try and stay focused fundamentally on these actions that you'll make a server create and do so that you can build out the things that you want to build. So in here, let's click through. We've got an overview. So we're gonna, it's, it's tricky to break this down into a set of categories. So we're just gonna try and stick to these three, like kind of random, kind of larger categories that we're looking at. The first of them is going to be data. And so we're gonna look at just how servers work with data in general and how they post that data, how you get to data and what servers are really doing with the internet. Then we'll talk a little bit about databases. Then we'll talk about APIs and where you get information from those and look at an example. Then we're gonna talk about how do you do computation in the server? How do you get it to do work and math and those sorts of things? And then from there, we'll talk a little bit about algorithms and microservices, things that are popular amongst developers right now. And then we'll work our way towards sort of like the, the bigger web infrastructure in Docker that's for large scale projects. Then we're gonna get to the real world physical computing, which may be an interesting spot for makers. And we'll sort of go from there. And then we'll do mobile apps and programs down at the end. So there's, there's lots of interesting and exciting things for us to go after. But the first one that we're gonna talk about in class tonight is data. So, Within data, the main thing that you need to think about when we're talking about the internet and data is servers in general. So they're the, the main vehicle that we use to push information around throughout the internet. And up here, I've got five examples of servers that you can run on devices. So we've got 
the Windows Server, which is maybe one of the, the big industrial sorts of versions. But then there's Apache, which was uh, ruled the roost for a little while. Then there's Node, which is very popular right now. It's all based around JavaScript. And then there's two Python ones that I like personally on the bottom, Django and Flask. And those two servers are apps that will let you spin up a website and from, from your computer host it to the broader internet. But it really sort of begs the question of what is a server and what is a server app? And so it's worth it for us to just take a second and I've got this sort of hokey little diagram. A server is sort of like this thing right here. So this is an Apache server. It's your eyes and ears out from a computer to the internet. A server like that, like Apache, for example, or maybe Node or, or Flask, those are going to give you a way for your computer to have access to the broader outdoor environment that the computer exists in. So it'll open a port and listen for communication to come in through that port so that you can interact with it. So if someone asks a computer, like for example, this one has an IP address of 542 something. And so if, if something asks the computer at that IP address at its port 5050 for a web page, the Apache server that's in there will listen to that request and it's just listening basically and then it will respond with either a, this is an invalid request or it'll send back the web page that, that was asked for. So basically a server just listens to the internet at a specific port on a computer in a way that's safe, keeps everything stable. And then from there, you can, you can send back HTML, CSS or JavaScript code for that browser or that device to run from the internet. So servers live in this space sort of like looking outward from your computer, being ready to give any uh, responses that they get from the internet, which, which does a lot. Uh, and so one of those servers that you could fire up pretty easily is a Flask server. And on screen, these like, you know, there's maybe eight or nine lines of code there. In those just few lines of code, that's enough that you can have a computer that will absolutely respond with a web page. It's not a complicated web page, but if you go to this computer, you can see here there's localhost at port 5000. You would be able to get a little tiny web page back that just says hello world. Also, if you want to know a lot more about Flask, and this is absolutely a strong recommendation, if you've got hours and hours and hours, we're talking like a hundred hours that you want to invest. There's a fantastic mega tutorial by Miguel Grenberg that is just phenomenal. Uh, he walks you through all of the steps. It's written. There's also videos that go along with it. He's got all of his code in a Git repository that you can check out at different stages. And you can learn from what he has written and what he's got assembled. It's a really, really good. Uh, but basically, it explains kind of in general about how you use Flask as a server to rebuild from scratch something like Twitter. So it's a really fantastic uh, tutorial, but you can do a lot of really simple things and really complicated things with servers. And so there's, there's tons of options with them. Flask is just one. Another one that's really worth mentioning is Node. And so Node is a, another server that you can run. It's a, it's a way to look out at ports on a computer and to try and get a response to be spit back. And so Node is really popular because it's written most, it's written in JavaScript. And most of the internet is written in JavaScript. And so in using JavaScript for your server and for your websites, you can consolidate. You don't need Python developers for the server and JavaScript developers for the website. You can have JavaScript developers in both, in both realms, which may be easier for you if you're doing it as a hobby or if you're a business, you only need to try and find and hire essentially one type of developer, someone who's good at JavaScript. So it's a really interesting thing. And it's Node is a, a package that you install. It's a native desktop runtime or a, a computer runtime instead of running JavaScript just in a browser. And it's something that you can definitely install. Like I have Node installed on my computer. And if I do Node V down here in the terminal, it tells me that I've got Node 12.6. 12.16.1. And I can use Node to run different files. Like right here, I've got a very tiny little Node, uh, Node ready file. 
that it's just going to open up a server on port 3000 on my computer. And then it's going to serve just this one line of HTML. And that's all it'll do. But I can get that to spin up as a server by telling Node that I'd like to run things. I want it to run the file called app.js. So if I hit enter there, you can see it gives me feedback that the server is running at this URL. And if I click there, it'll open this up. And there it is. And if I turn off that server, if I if I close this, if I hit Control C, which stops most terminal commands, pop back over here, and if I hit refresh, if I can find my cursor, there we go. The glare is bad. You can see it's having a problem. The page can't be reached. The server is what hosts that web content, that little tiny web page. And when I turn the server off, you can't get to the website anymore. Which is which is interesting, right? I can I can spin up a web server with just a few lines of code, you know, headed back over to here. This is 14 lines of code, and some of them are blank, right? It's a very small amount of code that it can take to make a web server, and you can host all sorts of different things through that through that vehicle. There's a ton of opportunity here, and you can basically use this code to to run and write and do whatever you want. But interesting things that are worth noting here is that when we turn off the server, the website doesn't exist anymore, right? And so we're so, I think that we're so used to an internet where I can go to skittles.com at any moment of the day or night and have my Skittles internet needs met, that it's a thing that we forget that it needs to have a computer that's turned on somewhere physically. Like there needs to be a real machine in a place that is turned on and ready to send me skittles.com whenever I might need it. And not, I'm not endorsed by Skittles to be clear. But uh, for for this, you really can get a website that will work as long as the server is spun up and it's listening to requests from a browser. So that's a really interesting tool to be able to have and to access. We're going to be able to look at that a little bit more. Let me do this. Get back into presenting view. Do, 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 do. This down over here. And then this with F11. Okay, so as, as you think about serving websites, serving a static website, whether it says hello world or whether it has a more complicated thing, a single web page isn't usually the most interesting kind of thing that you would be building. Uh, just, a, just one page can be helpful. And I've got, I'll put in, I'll put in the foundation chat, a link to a personal like resume page that I built last spring when I was job hunting to move to Connecticut. And it's just a single page. And that's great. I can write all the code for a page. But usually, if you want to do something, you want a more complicated website that's going to have some data or information that comes along from it. And so in order to do that, in order to build a more complicated web page that can build up content on the fly, you're going to need a database of some kind. Because then you can store your information in a place and then you can pull that information out and be able to use it to build your website, especially if your server can make requests to your database. And you can imagine a database that might store information about products that you have for sale, like their price, maybe a photo, uh, maybe like how many you have in stock, all sorts of things like that that would be stored by a database that you'd want to reference. So these are different versions of databases. We're going to mostly stick to relational databases to try and build our ideas about these just as we're getting started with them. Uh, but databases can be really useful. And fundamentally, I want you to think about them like spreadsheets. The one that I, you know, there's SQLite is a great one to use. You can see the SQL shows up a lot in these names. And that's because SQL SQL is the language that works directly with databases. It's structured query language, I think, right? Yeah, structured query language. And so, that language is, is how you'd ask a database for information that's in it or how you'd push information into the database. So from there, just what is a database about? Like what's going on? Essentially, it's just a collection of tables. And so a database table like this is a good example. This is just data I got from Kaggle, which is like a data science competition land I had some students do work with a few years ago. Uh, but database tables are really just spreadsheet tables. They're often hidden from you. You usually can't see them in a database um, without some sort of a viewer that pulls all of that info at once. 
but this is just like data from I think this is Billboard top top 50 for like the 1967 May 27th uh, date. So like it's just a little bit of information. But if you look, like one row pertains to one idea. Like a Reefer Franklin respect was ranked number two on that date. And that was on that particular day. You can see the last week, the peak rank, and some of those other pieces of information. But everything about Aretha Franklin's respect is in that one row. A single column describes the same property for each row. And then each row gets a primary ID. So that's like an identifier. I could say, I'd like the information from line number 20, please. So you can start to ask questions of your database by being able to identify specifically which which part of the database you're looking for so these are definitely the the tables that you you should be thinking about when you're thinking about databases uh, and there's a lot of nuance to how do you structure your tables like what do you want your columns to be how would you like your how do you want to relate your database tables to each other and how do you try and do it in such a way that you don't build a lot of duplicate data because if you're accessing a database you know a few hundred times a minute, that's not a big deal. But when you start accessing a database thousands of times a second, then like how much do you duplicate, how much do you optimize really starts to matter. So as you scale this up into much larger data sets, this can be a big deal. Probably not a risk for like a hobby website, but it's definitely something to keep in mind as you're thinking about a scalable project. So when you have databases, you'll often want more than just one table for information. And so bringing that together, you'll certainly want to think about how do you want to relate your database tables together? And this is a database map to represent the ideas of a relational database. Each one of these boxes could represent a table. And then the little lines are connecting those tables to each other. So it looks just looking at this map, it seems clear to me that this is articles and users. This is maybe a blog. Uh, something where you might have groups and user groups, maybe a message board, something like that. Uh, but then all these links can link together who was authoring what article, what topics are you following, what articles fit into which topic. You can have lots of different linkages that bring together ideas in a relational database. And this can get really complicated really fast. Your first database, if you ever want to build one, should, should be fundamentally a simple thing. And then you can slowly build them up over time as you realize more things that you want to store, more information that you want to have. And there's even some like cheater ways to do databases. Maybe you make everything just a row of JSON data. And then you can decide later what you want your JSON data to be. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can play around with relational databases. But you'll want to think about how do you want to link your data? Is it like if you're talking about articles, is is a relationship between tables one to one, one to many, or many to many. Like one author might have many articles that they've written, or you might have many people that are connected to many topics. So you may need to cross reference. You can have cross reference tables that look like favorite articles down here, where it's just a, a this favorite articles down here in the orange. That would be a good way to link a user to articles that they've favorited, right? You can just say, I want this user's ID connected to this article ID. And then I know that if it's in this table, they've favorited that article. So it's an interesting way to relate those things. Can I can I jump in for just a, a absolutely quick at the end of that? So so uh, this this sometimes is called um, like a, a resource diagram, right? Like an enter, an entity resource diagram and um, it can get kind of complicated, uh, as you can probably imagine, but uh, increasingly in the world, and, and we can see data in pretty much anything now, um, understanding the most basic elements of the SQL programming language, it's not really a programming language, but the, the SQL language uh, and how tables of data can relate like this, even at like a super basic level, can be very advantageous to, to your job. Uh, and if it's something that you ultimately find interesting can, can really uh, be very um, 
desirable in, in a hiring process. So I, I think it's just, um, it's worth saying like, this is my, obviously my wheelhouse, but uh, if anyone's curious or really wants to do a deep dive or, or has some, some, some serious questions now and forever, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to, uh, to explain stuff. So. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Like we're buzzing through topics here today, um, but every one of them is a real, like if you can do these professionally, if you're interested in even like dipping your toe into that world, they can each be a really well-paid career. <laughs> um, like being able to manage databases, being able to set up and manage a server well, they get most of the slides on here are in and of themselves a career that where you can do well for yourself. The other uh, thing too is like if, if you're at a job and let's say you're not an IT, right? You're yeah. you're in a department that's totally not about coding in any way, shape, or form. If if your department works with data and you have an understanding of how data is structured, that can really facilitate how you communicate with your IT departments or your your analytics departments at your organizations in a way that can be like really put you up above um, a lot of others or to help lead others or to help uh, and you know guide others on on ideas that they have so you can help to be like a translator and a facilitator of of change in organizations when you can help access and use the data that that drives that organization yeah, yeah, absolutely. That makes total sense. Being, being able to use these skills may be like a sneaky secret power in any job that you have. For, certainly, I've definitely used this in even as a teacher. I've used skills like this in processing, like how. Yeah, yeah, and we can go on and on, uh, but there's lots more slides, <laughs> so we got to keep moving. Or you can just bring up um, Anna's question from the chat real quick. Oh. Um, was, is there a database building exercise that simplifies this concept? You may not have one like right now, but I think that that could be a help. I yeah, I don't have one in my pocket, but I know that there are like drag and drop sort of database building things that totally work. And um, actually I've started to use pretty, like because I learned databases, I look at Google Sheets a different way now. If you use a Google form to collect information, you can, they can actually, because Google Sheets is like born and grown up in the web, they actually, you can write pretty much SQL requests to a Google Sheet and get information that comes back from a Google Sheets response to a Google form. So like if you wanna go deep into the nuts and bolts of like when you get Google Sheets response. I actually, at my last school, we had a tricky time tracking attendance for this weird situation where students could come in and out of a learning environment based on other programs they had, that it wasn't as straightforward as just like high school bells and classes. So kids would fill out one Google form. All they do is type in their student ID number. And in that you get their student ID number and a timestamp and I could, preload all their student ID numbers to like a name. And now I know who shows up when, where they logged in and like can track a ton of information just from them keying in their ID number. And so being able to build that out and think about the data that you have is really helpful. And there's definitely some ways to practice this that aren't like fully implementing a main like corporate level database. So I will research some of those. And if anybody else knows any that are like, fun getting started with databases, I'll, I'll find you some. Uh, but it's certainly a good skill to have leveled up on if you wanted to move up the, the ladder. But let's, let's say you're not interested in structuring a database, you just wanna use someone's database. In that case, you may want to get data from someone else or let a program talk to another program. If that's the case, you're gonna to want to do, or you're gonna to wanna to use an application programming interface or an API to let programs talk back and forth to each other. And so here are four examples. There's one from the National Weather Service and NOAA. The Internet Movie Database is a classic database of the internet where there's an API that you can reference, a cocktail database where you can get drink recipes, Sky Scanner where I think you can track flights that are going through the, through the air presently. Uh, but all of these are interfaces where you can get information 
if you don't want to build a database, you can get it from someone else's database, or there's other ways that you can interact with these things too. But just because I recently built a web, a web app for tracking the tide, here's a deep dive on how this sort of works. For, for the NOAA tides page, you can get on this interface a specific URL. And if you go there, you'll get information spit back to you. It's a really neat way to have machines talk back and forth. And so I've got, let's see, we can pull it up here. I think it's this page. And so here is the page that I wrote. And it's able to go and pull information about, oh, and it's, it's doing some things. Uh, but we can pull this up and look at its interface over here. And so basically, it's going to URLs to get information. So this is getting predicted tides here. It's, it's going to a specific URL and getting this information which is really not readable at all by a person. But if you look at this, you squint at it long enough, you'll see that there's C for a timestamp and V for what height we think the tide should be at a given time. And so just getting this information is enough that this page uh, can, and let's refresh the whole page, maybe hit control U, that I've got some JavaScript loaded in here towards the bottom that not only will it build the URL to go ask for that data, but it then learns how to process it. And so this is, I don't have the data about the tides. I'm not calculating that, but you can have an API be an end, a point where you can reach out to another program somewhere across the internet, get data from there. And then, because I'm collecting it with some code, I write some more code to handle it and turn it into a graph. So instead of having, when I go make the request, I get this back. But instead of looking at this on a web page. I use some JavaScript to turn it into a nice graphic so that I can more easily at a glance understand when it's supposed to be high tide, when it's supposed to be low tide, and how that changes throughout the day. And like the fact that the blue line is below the orange one tells me that we're a little bit below expectations today on our on our tide, which is totally fine. Uh, I don't I don't know actually what makes that vary. But it's a really interesting way to see that you can have programs talking back and forth to each other. And because this is a governmental body that's giving that data, it's all free. So like, I don't have to pay anyone. I don't need to authenticate. I don't need to do anything. It's a government service. And I just need to know exactly where and how to ask that question and then how to parse the response. And then this becomes really useful. There are also like IMDB is a paid service. They want you to pay for that data. They have their own website. But if you want to have like Alexa respond intelligently to who was in that movie with Keanu Reeves, then you need the database to have a, a data set so that, it, so that Alexa could respond to that. And so you can pay for access to their database, the IMDB, and they give you 49 pages of documentation right off the get-go for that database. I'm not sure how much it costs per month. It's probably based on the number of queries. They have all sorts of pay structures that can come up in something like this, but it's paid access to their database. They would never let you export the entire thing. That's, that's like what they're holding on to tightly and making money from, but they'll let you ask questions from it so that you can get information. And so they make it really easy. They manage the database parts. They do all the relational things. All you need to do is follow their documentation and you can ask intelligent questions so that you can respond to them nicely. But an API like this can be really helpful because you get access to information that you didn't have to collect and that you really don't have to manage. There's lots of APIs out there and there's, there's tons of opportunities for those to be really helpful. It's a really cool way to take a project that you've written and make it look much more professional really, really quickly. Um, so that's a, neat, that's a neat trick. But beyond that, beyond just getting, holding data and serving data, how do you compute data? How do you, how do you make that happen? Well, first off, we should say that computing data is essentially what the internet does well, right? That is, what the internet is best at, it's what Amazon does, Wikipedia, Chase Bank, Twitter and Facebook. A database-driven website is the core of the useful parts of the internet. And so just knowing that that's the, the metric, the thing that works, right? I need a, there needs to be a database somewhere in Chase Bank that magically knows how much money is in a bank account uh, that is able to show me that on screen and that when I need to make a transfer or withdrawal, all of that can be managed securely through Chase. 
you know, there's lots of different layers of things that have to go along with that, but it gives us a place to start. And so for a database driven website, here's just 20 random articles from Wikipedia. You can start to like abstract away the website a little bit. So take the step back view that we're doing with Wikipedia right here. And think about there's a template for most websites, right? Wikipedia, they don't write the CSS for every page. It's one CSS file, and then they access some sort of database for Wikipedia where people have written this content and they just pull it up. When you look for super fluidity on Wikipedia, they pull in the images, they pull in the text that people have written for them, uh, but they just plop it into their Wiki CSS template. And so that's really helpful. Same thing for Amazon. If Amazon adds a new product, they're not going to write a whole new web page. They're just going to put in new database entries. And then when you say that you want to buy, uh, when you want to buy an Animal Crossing Build a Bear through Amazon, which I don't know if you can do, then they'll build that website, that web page from the database information and their regular old template with you know the blue header and the orange stuff and, and the price and all that. So starting to think about pages that, that are abstracted away is really helpful. Now, in this templating build, this is really where Miguel Greenberg, Grimberg's uh, example really shines. He does a great job of replicating Twitter from nothing. Like carte blanche, he can, you follow his instructions, you'll make your own whole Twitter that you can host from, from a computer that you're in charge of. And so all of these are relatively easy. It's building the database that's really important, especially for something like Wikipedia. Uh, but being able to think about that and abstract away the content of a page from the styles on a page is something that's interesting to think about. Corey, and quick so, question about the, um, you know, basically hosting things on a computer that you control. Um, what amount of space is generally required? Is it just basically the same that it would take up if it's just hanging out on my computer, but broadcasting? Or is there additional space requirements that happen? No, it's so... It depends on how you're storing it. And if you want to have like redundancy and backups, um, I, I would imagine that like the data stored on Wikipedia, a lot of it's text and that's going to be pretty compacted. But like, if you think about, they have lots of static images and they prefer, you know, it, it, it's not going to be necessarily ballooned to be much larger. And usually I think probably what you're going to do is let's say I upload a photo to Facebook for example, Facebook, the very first thing they're going to do with that photo is they're going to compress it so that it takes up the least amount of data possible for two reasons. One, they don't want to, they don't want to spend any more money on hard drives than they have to, to like store everyone's high fidelity photos. But the second and probably more important reason is that they want it to come back, back to me as fast as it possibly can. So the more compressed it is, the faster they can have me download it when I say I want to look at the photos from 2014. So usually it's it's not any bigger than the files would be on your computer. Like it's not like Time Machine on a Mac really can like double and triple and quadruple the amount of storage that something takes up. Um, but typically you're not you're not necessarily unless you're doing wholesale backups of a server and businesses totally completely are. Um, but, but generally you don't have to have a ton of extra data. Like for my bar robot, I have a four gigabyte SD card, maybe eight gigabyte SD card on a Raspberry Pi. And that's more than enough for a web page, a few images, a uh, database. The, they're, they do a good job in setting these systems up to be as compactified as they could be. So even though like Google would have petabytes of data, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes. Um, you won't need that when you're just like spinning up a fun hobby website. I would be shocked if Wikipedia wasn't close to a petabyte of data, just with all the different things, all the articles, all the languages. I'm sure that they have a lot. And that's, you know, that's a thousand terabytes, which I guess really for a, a full, almost complete encyclopedia is pretty good. So, um, then now you've got all this data and you can build websites from it. How, how do you manage that? Like, what do you do beyond having data and doing some computations with it? Well, there's algorithms that we can drill down into microservices and then, and then workers beyond that. And then 
Celery is a really good Python based example of how to build up a, a server worker. And those are like background server tasks, but absolutely the, the companies on the right do this also. Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, Alphabet, which is Google, Apple would have the same sort of thing. And algorithms, this video is lovely. It gets into it, but they're basically like the processes that you use to actually make sense of things. Uh, I love, and I'm, I'm gonna play this, it's on mute. Uh, it's a PBS video, and the lady who does these is fantastic. She talks about the process of sorting data. And so sorting data sounds like it should be easy to just say like alphabetical order sort these, but it's, it's really rather complex. And so there's different ways that you could do that. Some of those ways are more efficient than others. And it's interesting when you start to scale websites to be very large, how much efficiency can you sacrifice or can you use do you want to make it readable? Do you want to make it efficient? I have an old roommate who worked for a major insurance company in America, and he wrote code that would run 10,000 times a second, a second. And so he needed to make sure that he squeezed every bit of efficiency out of that code so that it was possible for that code to run without, uh, without slowing down their computation globally. So sometimes you have to be really efficient with your algorithms with the way that you sort things, let's say, and other times you can be a little bit more lackadaisical. It won't be the problem that you run into right away, but if you're, if you're hopping into a business, they're definitely gonna want you to be conscious of algorithms. For us, for, for me, it's mostly like which algorithm works. Like I'm, I'm less worried about optimizing one version versus another. Usually my headspace is in, does it work or doesn't it? But then once you've got those, those skills down, you can start to think about how do I make this the best it could be? to go from there. Um, and there's there's tons, I would totally recommend watching that video. I'll put a link in the foundations class. But then, so let's say you have algorithms that are running, you have systems, you have code, you have all those different pieces that are going after it in, in a system that you've built. Modular parts are still a good idea. And so we've talked about building a project that's sort of like all one, all or nothing, and how that's generally a bad idea. The internet has probably done the best job of making modular projects work. And so for that, there's two sort of like realms. There's microservices where you can isolate out, like you'll have one server that does the web response. You'll have another server that manages maybe messaging back and forth between pieces. You might have a mail server that's separate from like the website server. User authentication can be handled somewhere else and like having different pieces and parts that connect together. That's a really interesting way to build a website that is hopefully more sustainable. It may not be what you go after first, but if you want like a stretch goal for where you'd be headed, that can be really interesting. Another one that's useful, and this has been really helpful for me as a maker with the, with the bar robot project, are workers. So there's the server that will listen to, re to requests and then respond. That essentially, that process can get stalled up in responding. So if you have something that you need to do in the background, like, like run a pump for a couple of minutes or blink an LED or on a website, like maybe somebody asks for a report and you need to prepare a PDF, like a process that you can run in the background. Uh, it can be a, something where, let's say I want my expenses for the past 12 months and that report is gonna take two minutes to run. I can say with the web server, like here's a new page, just wait two minutes and we'll have your report, a little spinning wheel. And then a service worker in the background on the server can actually build that report and then push it to me when it's done. So it makes it more of a snappy experience where like me, the person on the web browser is able to see that happen and like watch it come together. Uh, but, but I'm not held up waiting for that file to get built. The server can do that in the background. This is also good for like send me an email validation when they say it may take up to two or three minutes to get your validation email it's usually then being done by a worker in the background on the server somewhere but that is just the tip of the iceberg those are like the big ideas how do you build that is then its own whole infrastructure piece like there's very complicated solutions and if you know how to manage one of these things on a professional kind of level you're talking six figure salaries right so if you know how to really key yourself into Amazon Web Services and use that and optimize costs and get websites up and running, you can be a web development master with just that. 
Firebase is a database that's hosted entirely in the cloud by Google. And then there's Docker and Kubernetes, which are their own full thing that are, that are separate from those. So let's say you want to build a server with complicated sets of microservices. One handles email, one handles giving web pages. One part of it is your database. Another one sends uh, messages to, to Alexa or to a smart device somewhere. If you want to build something that's that complicated, you're going to have to start to think on an infrastructure level that is way deeper than any of the other things that we've looked at. This may be at first glance pretty terrible, but when you build it piece by piece, learning one little thing at a time, it's not the worst thing. And sometimes it can be more, uh, more reasonable if you can say, okay, let me figure out the database stuff first. I'll get that working. And then later I'll figure out the AWS Lambda stuff, right? So you work on one at a time to get your way through a big project. It also, if you're building a business, you can say we have a team that works on this part. We have a team that works on that part, which is, which is interesting. But all of these are pretty dependent on their platforms, which brings in Docker. And so the last two, there was Amazon Web Services and Azure, which is a Microsoft product. Those two products are pretty tied to the operating system that they're in. And that feels like a problem. If you get really well ingrained in, in the Windows environment, and then you, you get a new job, and all of a sudden they do everything Amazon, uh, maybe in Mac servers, then, then you've got a big issue in that it doesn't cross over. Docker has solved that problem, sort of, by making containers. So instead of hosting it on a, a computer or a virtual machine, you use containers that let you sort of abstract away all the weirdness of your operating system. You might have, like there's several of you that use Macs and I use Windows, and we might have experienced hiccups because we're not speaking the same language all the time. Docker somehow magically gets that to just disappear. You run containers on your machine, no matter what type of machine it is, and then it does what it's gonna do inside of that container, sort of independent. It saves you some overhead and does some things. They're really neat. I hear that Makehaven uses some Docker containers to run things in, in the makehaven.org website. And then if you get good at Docker, you can level up your game even higher with Kubernetes, which will manage different containers for you. So if you need more traffic in one container, you can have Kubernetes spin up another one. Or if a container crashes, you can have it restart it for you. There's a ton to be done here, but these are very, there are definitely web developers who have very full professions that are that are not using these systems, but they're really neat if you get if you get into them. If you're nerding into that really hard. But then what do what do we do from there? Right? Those are those are pretty high level concepts and the nuts and bolts of that. There's a bunch of tutorials online and I, I would love to go way into it with all of you on those. But I think it's better to bring it bring it back to sort of the maker space. Like what does this look like for us if we wanted to build something that was a little bit more hands-on than a website? And so we're going to focus on real world things like physical computing. So this is, this is like what you've done with an Arduino, but really intimately connected to the internet. And so here are just four platforms that give you that sort of access. There's the Raspberry Pi GPIO zero. And so you can do everything that a Raspberry Pi web server can do, but then you can use Python on the Raspberry Pi to also connect to its GPIO pin. There's P5, which is a JavaScript library that sort of lets you play with different um, parts of a node environment. MicroPython is, is Python that you can run on very small uh, hardware devices, not like a full computer Python. That would be more like GPIO zero, but MicroPython would be on like uh, our Arduino with a Wi-Fi antenna, an ESP8266 or just Arduino with ESP32. You can use Arduino itself if you like the Arduino programming languages to do these sorts of things also. But these will let you move around more than just information with your, with your devices. And so here's an example, right? You might have like a little light up system with green, yellow, and red. And it would be really cool if this Raspberry Pi could go to the internet and check the pollen counts for the day and give me a rating for how bad my nose is gonna be draining that day. Or like how puffy are my eyes gonna be on a green, yellow, or red scale. If it can go to the internet, figure that out, 
and then light up LEDs accordingly, it would be great to be able to know that uh, in some sort of a physical sense. I could have this mounted you know, by the door and have something that's really neat there. Uh, that would be a cool, a cool way to make it happen. Or an ESP32 weather station, you can go pull the information from the web with an API like my tides chart, uh, which it would be free data from the National Weather Service, and then display it on a screen. That would be really helpful to be able to see all in one shot. There's a few different ways, and I see I got a question from Anna. I will get to that in just a second. But there's there's like niche categories of these for different platforms. So for Node, there's serial port, where your Node server on a computer can talk to an Arduino through a serial connection or over USB. For Python, GPIO zero, the server, if like if you're running a Flask server in Python, then you can have it run Python commands that directly control the pins. That's how I get my barbot to work. And then MicroPython is more for small devices, uh, like a, like an R, like a ESP8266, a Wi-Fi card, Arduino, and then you can get those to run Python to to run their, to run those commands. Let's see this question. Anna's asking, can you model with a a color mixer, color picker, and so a database that lists colors, cross references with another. Ooh. Yeah. The, um, so when when we're looking at this, when we're looking at all these things, the the color pieces of all of like getting putting these taking these from abstractions, which is definitely where we're talking about them. Like thinking about these ideas when we're talking about a database or a database table, it's it's hard to give a sort of applied specific example. So a database example like this. You can imagine if this is my database, maybe a one table database, I could build a web page where it is giving you information about just who is the who is at what rank. Right? This this is a database table, but I could do like if we go to billboard top 100, this is probably going to give me all sorts of ads. Um, billboard top 100. If we go into here, we just do some searching. And so hot 100 chart billboard that seems billboard.com this sort of a website, they have some database somewhere in the background that's going to give them the information that builds this up right so up by Cardi B is the top. And then you work the driver's license. Uh, what's next by Drake is down, but it's some sort of a database that's informing that this is on that this is the number four hit. Right, and the fact that they have historical data about where Drake's song was last week, that maybe it was number three, they can say, well, it's gone down from what it was last week. And so there's a database in the background where when I build this, at the moment that I ask for it, they're pulling the information right then from the server. So I'm going to a server that's hidden behind this URL. And when I do that, let's pull this up. We can pull this up over here. Let's go to network. And I'm going to hit refresh on this page. You can see it's going and getting lots of data, right? So it's doing things, it's getting pictures, it's getting information. All of this is data that's being built out by that server just to fill in the information there. So it took a little bit of time, not a lot of time. You know, the internet's pretty quick, but it's able to go and say, here's the Hot 100 document. And then down over here, we start to get SVGs, some JPEGs. Here's the pictures. Like one of these is probably, you know, here's rows on the, there's probably different pictures I would want to pull up, none that are too objectionable, because uh, this is, you know, music album cover things. But in here, there's all sorts of information that comes back. So there's a database where they're able to go and say, like, here's the web page in response, and let's fill it out with data about who's got the top songs right now. And if I go to this web page next week, presumably lots of these things are going to be different because it's just going to, I'm going to this one URL asking the billboard server to give me information. And the, the server in the background says, here's the web page. And then hold on a second. I'm going to get you all the data to fill in that web page. So it does that for a few reasons. One, it wants to give me the web page as fast as it possibly can. And then it uses JavaScript probably to go collect all that data to build it out. 
it means that the website itself gets ranked slightly better. Um, but it's doing computations to say, well, I looked at all the rankings from this week and I'm gonna look at all the rankings from last week and I'll do a calculation to decide that what's next is down one, right? Or that up is up one or that leave the door open is up one, right? So it's able to do calculations based on those. If I were imagining this database, I would just have like a, a table with rows that say the week that we're in and the ranking of a song, right? I wouldn't have a ton of information. I'd say, this is the song, this is its current rank, and this is the timestamp of when we're recording that. And so I'd go look for, okay, the top 100 songs, I've found what those are for this week. I'm gonna sort them by the date, and then I'm gonna go back and look for every one of those 100 songs and see what they were the previous week to know if I put a green up arrow or a red down arrow or no arrow. So using a database like this to build or using a database to build a website like this you can start to have information that gets really structured my gut says that they probably have this information as an api if i roll all the way to the bottom in terms of use private privacy policies advertising uh ad choices they probably have somewhere in here my guess is that billboard will also let me use their database if I want to pay them a lot of money for it. View all billboard, top 20, info, maybe it's one of these, not sure. But there's tons of things that you could try and get from here. So a database like this is going to be able to give you information. Or like here, it's pretty, pretty raw what the database is giving, that it's giving back information like this that looks like times and Heights. This is this is a simpler database where each one of these you can imagine is sort of a row in a database, even though it's in a different format, but it's it's giving you basically that. And by looking at all these data points, I can build out a graph from the data that's there. It's it's definitely a heady topic. It's not um, it's something that takes a little while to settle into. I would totally recommend if you wanted to build websites with servers, you follow some tutorials that will walk you through rather than just trying to build one from a blank slate without instructions. It's definitely good to follow, follow the leader. And I posted a video in the chat before class. It's really great. I love the guy, he's super animated. He's from NYU and he has a good tutorial on how to build a node server with a little, with a database connected. If you wanted to get, just get started with building a short one, you could follow along with his video series. I think it's like six or seven videos each about 20 minutes if you wanted to build a server yourself. But that said, Docker Kubernetes, the real world, your physical computing, the internet of things. This is one of our last things that I wanted to make sure that we got to is the internet of things in a world of, in the world of 2020, when we're surrounded by devices all the time, there's plenty of good ways to get connected to the internet, whether it's your doorbell or your locks on the door, whether it's your car itself is connected with the internet, there's tons of ways to make that happen. Adafruit actually has Adafruit IO, which is their way to help you do that easily. It's a paid product. You'll have to put a little cash in and then you can have a, a project be managed. The back end things get easier because they'll do it for you. And you just sort of connect following their instructions or you can go at your own with MQTT, which is a transfer pr protocol that's open source or Azure and Amazon Web Services both have IoT solutions you can use. But IoT is the Internet of Things, uh, products that are connected inherently to the Internet. And so here's a few examples, you know, like the, the Alexa, the Google Home, the Ring doorbells, there's a, the air quality sensors, the Nest thermostats, that blue one. I'm, I'm not sure. I was just looking that up today. I haven't really ever wrapped my head around it. I think that's a button you can put in your house. And when you press it, it'll order something for you from Amazon. It's like the shortcut, is the most shortcut button to buy something, which feels very on target for Amazon. So good, I guess good on them. Although I, don't, I never want one of those in my house. Uh, yeah, I think it's like you can program it to when I press the button, buy more toilet paper. I think that's what it's for. It feels like it's very, very much their, their target thing. The, I have several of these down here. Whoop. Several of these smart plugs. I really like those. You can plug them in, uh, like plug in a, a 
lamp and put it on a timer so it'll turn on at night it'll turn off when you want to go to bed they're they're really um fascinating yeah kate has good advice don't ever get one of those blue buttons if you live with children they'll just want to press it and buy the thing it seems yeah that seems very very dangerous um the phillips two light bulbs people love those i've definitely had friends that really go all in on those they are they are really neat um doorbell cameras this is a smart lock i'm personally not a huge fan of smart locks because they it is then a smart device iot devices are are really convenient for lots of things but they are also presently and we haven't figured it out yet really they're also really a security risk in a lot of ways. Because if I have a computer controlling my locks, unless there's really good authentication, now it becomes hackable, right? The, the first thing that happens when one of these products comes out is that you'll get someone partnered between like Yale and Stanford and they'll hack into somebody else's car on the other side of the country, yeah. right? You can imagine the, the havoc that could be wreaked if that was not just a one-off researcher event, but like, a regular thing. And so basically, in summary, I'm probably not going to ever put a smart lock on my front door. But they're, but they're interesting. It's neat that they exist. I'd love to know more about how they tick. Uh, the ones that do measuring rather than control things, I, like, I think I like a little bit more, like this air quality one. I'm all in. But you can definitely build your own of these. And I, I'm sorry that I opined a little bit in here on this one, but IoT is an interesting topic that we could certainly have a lot of armchair discussion about you know, armchair philosophy and sort of see what we like or dislike about all these things. Uh, but you can certainly build them yourself if, you're, if you've got no qualms about the security. And if you build them yourself, it's probably less likely to get hacked just by obscurity. Um, so there's security through obscurity as a thing just because it's a weird one-off situation. It wouldn't be as likely someone would come find you. Uh, but that, that's interesting. So let's say that you wanted to, if you have some small device that you'd like to connect as an internet of things, um, you might get it to give you information, to send it commands or to, to take readings from it with an MQTT message broker. And so it's this transfer protocol that's really targeted at low power and low information for like very small um, power draws so that you can get information that go back and forth. Ooh, a good a good question. What if you, how about an IoT device to put onto a almost smart vacuum so that when it gets stuck, it can tell you that it's stuck? Uh, that'd be really neat. And something to connect into an app. IoT, so, the, oh, the question is something connected to an app, would that be considered part of IoT? Uh, I think it depends a lot on how it connects to the app. If it connects to the app like locally through Bluetooth, I would say that's probably not IoT. IoT things usually connect through Wi-Fi to your, your Wi-Fi network, typically. And so they're connected to the internet and then back to you through some web interface. The, and the further it goes out into the broad internet, the like more of a vulnerability it is to you coming back. So that you really have to sort of get into the nuts and bolts of those things to understand it a bit better. A smart, I have a smart vacuum at home that was like the, which is great, um, but it's the, the least smart of those vacuums. Whereas I know I have family with a Roomba that like will send you a message when it's done. Mine like just wanders around the room, gets stuck, doesn't tell you that it's stuck. It just goes quiet. And then you have to go find it and, and like bring it back to its base. Um, so there's different levels of things that sort of qualify as, smart devices, but it's, but it's not, you know, there's, there's some nuance to what you'd call IoT. That is a emerging field that I think will continue to develop over the next decade. But the way that a lot of them do com communicate is through MQTT, these brokers and clients. This is something that you can absolutely do as well. Uh, and I've got one queued up right here. If I do, instead of node app.js, I do MQTT. JS. This is another one that with just a few lines of code, I can get uh, MQTT server up and have it send messages back and forth. This is, you know, there's some configuring here, but you can imagine if you had a, a small Wi-Fi connected Arduino, you send it a command like turn on and it could read, listen for that command 
and turn on a, a fan or turn on a, a pump or something that might be useful in some way or another. This MQTT is a protocol that's different from what you get for um, browsers where you send big files. This is for really tiny files. And so, oh, the Neato vacuum connects to your Wi Fi for what it's worth. I would definitely then call it a smart vacuum, a real, like an actually smart vacuum if it connects to your Wi Fi. If it doesn't connect to the Wi Fi, like mine doesn't. Then it's it's like a it's a robot vacuum, but not a smart robot vacuum. Would be how I would distinguish that, if that makes any sense. Um, so MQTT lets you send information back and forth, and it's it's really small amounts of data. And so really, ultimately, it's kind of like Twitter for robots, where they're sending little messages, and usually they'll subscribe. Like I might have a, a client subscriber that's listening to a broker and it's listening to a certain topic at a broker. So when it gets a message, it'll take an action. There's a, there's a fair amount of complexity to the standard. It's something I'm hoping to learn more about, uh, but you can use it as a good way to get a web server to talk to remote objects and send information back and forth between them when those remote objects are, are small in size and scale, maybe powered by batteries. It's a neat, it's a neat trick to explore if you're interested in that scale. Corey, um, on the along that we had a Make Haven member who built a um, a dog bowl that would send an alert to his phone when the dog bowl or the water bowl was empty. Would that be something that would that be an example of this? Oh, it, it, it totally it totally could be, um, and it it varies quite a bit about the mechanics of how he wants to have that happen. So. Depending, like I have a thousand follow-up questions rather than giving you a flat answer, um, which is probably not satisfying. He could be running a very tiny MicroPython server on that thing, connected to his Wi-Fi and then port forwarded out to his phone, which is not the safest. He could be running a cloud server with an MQTT broker and then a device in the, in the food bowl that sends messages to that broker that's in the cloud, and then the cloud server contacts his phone. There's there's many different ways to do that same thing, and it's sort of like deciding which one you like, which one has the right amount of setup for you, and like how deep in the weeds you want to go. Sometimes there's there's definitely a rabbit hole that goes too deep with these. It also depends on who you are. Like if you're trying to do a project as a technical demonstration. So that at the next interview, you can be like, look at the cool thing I made just for fun. Uh, then maybe you do want to go down that rabbit hole. If, if instead you want to just build something that will get, send you a message, maybe you pay the, I don't know, I think it's like maybe five bucks a month to Adafruit IoT. You follow some instructions and it just works. And then you're not, you know, it's not quite as much of a technical prowess move, but it, it would still be very functional. And if you have a cat with like special dietary needs, it could really help you out a lot. Uh, so there's a whole range of ways to solve lots of problems. And, and pausing a little bit before you invest a ton of energy into it can be really helpful to think about sort of the scale that you want your response to be. In, in this, like in going over MQTT, I'm just trying to identify this is, a, this is definitely a thing to Google if you're thinking about this scale of a project. I'm, this is emerging more as a platform. Uh, Aaron's Home Assistant uses it a lot. It's like, in my mind, it's getting established. It's probably been around longer than I'm understanding it. Uh, but it's definitely neat for that sort of Arduino scale kind of project. So mobile apps and programming. So then here's, if you wanted to do one thing from this week, this is what I think you should do. MIT App Inventor is delightful. It works amazingly well, uh, and it's very approachable. You can build an Android app easily. And so if you have an Android device, uh, first off, congratulations, I'm with you. And from there, you can build an Android app that is fun and easy to access. It can really legitimately go on the app store for Android's Google Play immediately so that people can download your app, they can play with your app, you can do things. And this has got, even though it may be easy to start with, it actually can go pretty deep in that you can do, it's more than just drag and drop. So you can, you can connect to APIs, you can get data, you can do lots of things with this. There's a ton of different options for how to develop an app on MIT's App Inventor into something that's really special. 
Uh, and then these are three instructions that are just right there. Hello, per a little talking cat app, uh, translation app, I think, text to speech, and then here's the translation app. So there's some really cool tutorials that exist in here that are worth exploring. So what are, oh, excuse me. What are the things that you should try and do this week? Because we talked about the most I think we ever have, the most of like different topics, most of these on their own, any one or two slides could be a whole career. Um, and so what, what could you possibly do to get started with this? The first and maybe the biggest suggestion for everybody is make a simple app on MIT App Inventor and just make it something fun, right? Like some little app that you'd be able to play with, do, and it may just be something snarky or fun or funny. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything too technical, but it's just good to play in that realm. The next thing that you could do is spin up a web server with a hello world page. And, and so I did that once in here and I pulled up an MQTT server. So it doesn't need to be anything big, uh, but just getting everything lined up so that nodes installed, so that you've got the file that you need to have, you found the hello world instructions, and then like getting that up and running can be really satisfying. It's definitely gonna feel a little bit more technical than the MIT App Inventor will. Another thing that would be really cool is if you put a web page out on Heroku. So you, if you put something out in, and I know I talked about that last week, not this week, but if you put a website out in the cloud, hosted from a cloud platform would be cool. And Heroku has a free tier. So if you're trying to build a cat bowl that tracks things, you could do it with a node server out on Heroku in their free tier, which is which limits you a little bit and how much compute time you can do. And it, it there's a few asterisks to that relationship being free, but it, it's pretty reasonable. And then the last one and like the stretch goal that I'd really love to see somebody do this week is use some device like an ESP32 or a Arduino with Wi-Fi on it to host a web page from its own little server with a button that you click and it turns an LED on and off. And that sounds like a simple thing. Sometimes those words are easy to string together, uh, but it's actually a really good example of a tour de force of understanding and skill if you can make that happen. There's got to be tutorials for it, uh, but it's a really cool project to make happen. And if somebody pulls that off, they should feel really, really proud about what they've been up to this week. Also, I have an ESP32 laying around at home. If you want one of those, and there's definitely some over at the electronics bench, I'll pull those and we can play with, play with them. These are, which is this guy, by the way. This is maybe a, an 8266 an ESP8266, these are little tiny, this little chip here, the one with the silver can over it, that is a small, and it's even like you can see the gold pit. Let me just pull it up on the internet. I, I should do that. Um, control T, ESP8266. So here they are. This is the, there's a handful of these over in the electronics area, but these, this little chip right here will let you connect to the internet through Wi-Fi, and it's got enough processing power that you can host a very simple web page from that chip, which is kind of mind blowing. So it doesn't have to be a lot. You know, here for less than two dollars, you can get one of these devices and you can be hosting web pages from them. Internet of Things with ESP8266. This is actually the chip that's inside of most of those IoT devices, just because they're so cheap. They're the, the cheapest way to make this happen. And so I would definitely recommend that if you wanted to try something, you go for it with these. You can, you can certainly get them on Amazon uh, or the other, this is the, the slightly older one, or there's the ESP32 is the slightly newer version. That's got a little bit better Wi-Fi. It's also got Bluetooth on it. Um, and it's a little bit higher processing, a little bit smarter brain. So you can do a bit more with your web server. So these are interesting devices. If you wanted to do something with that, there's tons of potential, but there are lots of ways to be successful this week with all sorts of different stuff. But we are at 8.13. I've talked longer than my allocated time. I should, I should try and wrap it, you know, tighten it up and then see if we have any outstanding questions, first of all, or if we should just bust into show and tell everybody.
So anybody have a question you want to ask before we get to uh, show and tell? Let's see. Oh, yeah. Cool. You want to show and tell right now? Okay. Uh, so Ada is going to show and tell right now. Let me, or, oh, no, you're going to head out. Oh, okay. All right. So Ada's going to go home and maybe show and tell from there. You don't have, also don't have to, but yeah, no, yeah, no worries. Let me quickly, so I just want to drill down a little bit further on here's, let me open up. So in, in these, while people are getting ready, we're going to do show and tell in a second. Uh, let me pull up the files for that tides page because I think it's it's interesting to see perhaps. So in in here I have a magic mirror at home and I hope that one day we can all be together in the same room and you can see it. But in order to make that a little bit nicer, we I live pretty close to the river. And so I like to monitor the tides. And so I just want to know when and how they are. So I, I wrote this JavaScript and you can see over here on the right that this is lots of JavaScript starting here at the top that's JavaScript and all of this is JavaScript. All the green are comments. I put a ton of comments on here because it's just a thing that I do see ya. And so on these comments, you can see that I'm sort of walking through what's going on. I've first, I have three functions basically. The first function uh, to talk to the NOAA server is I'm going to build the URL where I want to actually ask NOAA for that info that I popped up on screen a few times. Then I have another uh, function where I actually go and get the data from NOAA directly where I ask them for the data and I turn it into a meaningful list that my JavaScript can then use. And then the last one of these is I draw a graph using uh, chart.js, which is something that I didn't write, that somebody that exists as a public resource, and I use to build the graph on the fly from the data that's been collected. And so in here, I've sort of grouped it. If you wanted to read through this, I tried to put in enough comments that it would make sense. Um, and you can sort of walk through if you're interested in and sort of dipping your toes into that JavaScript. So it was fun to sort of flex those muscles. I don't always wander through JavaScript, but it feels pretty close to C++. A, a major difference, though, is that instead of declaring ints or bools or strings, you you just declare variables as const or, or let. So there's you know a couple of ways to do it, but they're not strongly typed. So I don't have to tell it whether it's going to be a number or a letter or a few letters or, a, or an object, which is its own whole thing. You wanted to do object-oriented programming in here? In JavaScript, you can. And so there's all sorts of interesting things that you can do with that. But if you wanted to read through this and try to make sense of it, I'd be happy to pick through that with anybody at any point. But it's all available through GitHub. So you can you can totally download this if you want. And then look at that. But that said, that was my that was my big one this week. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing and then put everybody up. And I want to hear what you all do. Because there's so many things. Like we played hide and seek, which was lots of fun. Um, and I want to know what else you did. So whoever would like to unmute and see what we've got. I can go, Corey, because I, I have to I have to check out a little early today. Yeah. 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 Um, so yes, and sorry I'm late. I'm gonna have to watch this video again because even if I was right on time, I feel so overwhelmed and confused about a lot of this stuff. Um, which is funny because I really want to not be confused about it. I'm really excited to learn a lot of this stuff, but it's it's so much. And so I have to just figure out where I'm going to start. So this week um, I did the, the you know, find the, the blinking uh, Raspberry Pi, and that was fun. And then I um, learned how to control my Raspberry Pi with my iPhone, which was really cool. And then kind of brainstormed some ideas for automating a few of my appliances in my van so that I can just check on my system, make sure everything's okay, you know, 
have a video camera in there and see like what's going on, if there's any problems, have a GPS in case it ever got stolen, um, turn the heater on, you know, that kind of thing, uh, turn it off uh, if I'm not in the car. Cause sometimes, you know, if I'm, let's say I'm in Make Haven and I'm parked somewhere and I know I'm gonna sleep in it, I want that thing warm before I come get into it. So um, being able to do those stupid little things would just make it funner um, or nicer, um, or cozier is actually the right word. Um, so um, not important, but I just thought it would be a good way to learn some of these skills. I think it's gonna be a little too much. So I'm gonna just start off with something simple, probably with an MIT app builder um and maybe just talk to you about some of those other things that were covered after i watched this um class again cool yeah and what what was the name of the app that we ended up using to get to the raspberry pi oh let me pull it up um on my phone it was on an android phone you can you can download putty and so it's called putty. it's called yeah for if you have an iphone it's a pi helper and so in Pi Helper, you connected it. You could, it was a really cool app. Like you could see the CPU usage, the like amount of memory that's being used. And there's a terminal, right? Yeah, the terminal looks exactly like it does on the Pi. I was even able to turn it off. Um, so that was really promising. Yeah. And I have one of those little um, uh, Arduino, like, um, knockoffs that has a Bluetooth and a Wi-Fi in it. And I remember when I tried to use it, it was it wasn't it was a little glitchy. So maybe I'll give that another shot this week as well. And somehow implement that with the MIT app so that and maybe even the Raspberry Pi helper. See if I can kind of join Arduino with Raspberry Pi and get them to work over an app. I that yeah. might be a little ambitious, but one can dream. It's yeah, it's a little in inside of a week when other things are going on, it's good to take a measured set of goals. So it's yeah. real in, in this realm, it's really easy to string together lots of cool sounding words. But it's good to just like let yourself have just one little win at a time. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. Maybe just even getting comfortable setting up that Arduino and getting it to work and just opening up the MIT app and tinkering, tinkering around with it, not actually making an app, I, you know, I'll, I'll be good with those two things. Yeah. But, um, and just watching this video again and trying to comprehend some of it. Yeah. Some of it I got and some of it was just really way over my head. Oh, there's, there's it's a real deep pool, so don't, don't feel bad. The, okay, awesome. It sounds like you did a ton. I'm excited to see what happens this week. Let's see who would like to go next. We've got lots of people. Who, Aaron is unmuted. Would you like to go? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> this week was was particularly revelatory for me. Um, this is a side of things that I've always I've always struggled with. Um, I think that there's parts of it that that make good sense to me, uh, but just as soon as I understand something, it gets much more complex. Uh, I think that's that's kind of the point. So um, I'm just gonna like list off some stuff that I've done. I spent a lot of time learning about the differences between different types of APIs, between like REST and GraphQL, and like what that what that means, um, and what that means in terms of what I need to code. And like kudos to Ruby, because it was like, hey, if you can anticipate what you don't know, right, then like, you know what you need to know. And that was like me sort of like figuring out, well, okay, like, what can I play with? What would I need in order to play with that? How do I, how do I start to pull that down? Um, like more on a conceptual level, I, I, I honestly can say I, I don't, I don't think I really quite grasped the difference between servers and clients and how like Node.js and JavaScript worked with that. Uh, which was great. Um, 
playing around with JavaScript was interesting because I always thought like you have to learn Python, and then I'm like, I think I, I think I like JavaScript. So, so that was kind of like a, a fun little discovery um, that maybe I just haven't found my, 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 you know, the language that I really wanted yet. So I, I'm enjoying that. I played around with a lot of APIs, um, quite a few actually, uh, just like dabbling both uh, through VS Code and through Postman. Which is like a, a program that can make it much easier to 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 try pulling data from things, um, and then finally, I made like two apps. I guess you could say uh, one was uh, a, a, like a web page that that allowed Corey and I to send compliments to each other. So, uh, but like that's 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 living on Glitch. Um, I still one of the things I still need to learn is like how to keep uh, access IDs and tokens private. Um, because like, that's part of the reason why I'm not showing any of this is because I've got like, I don't know how to secure it yet. So I could show you a bunch of messy code, uh, and stuff that on a recording would not be ideal. The so short, like one line answer is you want to learn how to make a dot and ENV file, the mm -hmm. dot and the environment files. I, uh, I made my first dot ENV, but I, I still don't trust that I've got it right. So I'll have to, I'll have to look into how to do that better. Yeah, and uh, then you put it, you put the dot env into a get ignore. So, so when you oh, so use, it doesn't upload. So it doesn't upload. Yeah, that's clever. All right, maybe I'll um I'll ask you some further questions on that once I get there. And then the last thing I did, uh, and this is like probably the like, this is the first thing that I made uh, was a little app that texts me He Man gifts. So, so that was like you know I have the power it was just to like get a little morale booster going uh um with uh with the twilio api so it's been like a smattering of 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 stuff i think um corey showed me a really great video tutorial on a youtube channel called the coding train yeah. um and like wow it's like talking to you like an adult but everything's packaged to be like it's like Saturday morning cartoons and you're learning how to code. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like it, the way that the bells and the whistles work. It's almost like he's programming my brain to like learn programming. Um, I've been binge watching them. Like I just found it recently and like coding videos are something that are a slog, not this guy. Yeah. It's fascinating. So I, I, um, I would highly recommend, recommend that. Um, yeah. I, I think that he definitely makes some assumptions on what you know, but he explains what he's doing uh, on, on a step-by-step -step basis and really does his best to explain them things very concisely. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Let's see if I can pull up the, the compliment app real quick. I could probably show that. Uh... Oh yeah, there's the coding train. So just take I'll one. send I'll send a specific like I've been binge watching two different series of his already and I'll send along specific links for those after we're done with class. All right, almost there. Yeah, this is gonna never mind. Oh wait, 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 wait. Also the coding train guy is at NYC, in case you're curious. He is sort of local, which is kind of fun. Yeah, okay. So I'm I'm still navigating a lot of this stuff. Um, here it is. So I I would highly recommend Glitch. Um, Glitch is uh, a website that I've used before, and it kind of allows you to have everything in one place, so you don't you don't need to worry so much about. Um, Maybe like having all your IDEs together and having like everything um, configured properly. I have a lot of problems with that. So, okay, can everyone see this? Yep. So I don't I don't remember Corey's number off the top of my head, but that's okay. Um, I can come in here and just type in my name and give myself a compliment. Uh, uh, and be like, you know, um, and then I can send myself a compliment and it'll text my phone. So, which uh, I'm going to prove 
it's right next to all the He-Man memes. I don't know if you can if you can see that, but there's like a bunch of gifs on there. So, yeah, it's it's little baby steps, little baby yep. steps. Ruby, good call. We're gonna black out. We're gonna if we can, Kate, blur the screen because that was phone numbers. Okay, yeah. Oh, that phone number that doesn't matter. That's um, you know, it's, yeah. It's, Yep. Yeah, if we could blur it out, that would be cool. But it's a it's a Twilio <laughs> phone number, so cool. So yeah, but it's a really cool. Like it was, it was really genuinely one. It's heartwarming, and two, it's a uh, it's cool that you can like make an app that is then able to send text messages, and the person can like you can send messages through a web interface. Their cell phones are already like completely internet connected. It makes <laughs> sense that they can that they can get messages that way. So. Aaron, you're, you're like going down the rabbit hole of really interesting things, like getting connected to your data. And I love how it's just spinning into your professional work. Yeah, like I, I, I would say it's, I've taken for granted that the tool that I use is so good at connecting the things that whenever I run into a situation where someone hasn't done it before, or maybe someone hasn't documented the idea of being able to, to do it myself, um, is, is really powerful. And I, I have engineers that would do things like that, but, but to have a notion of how to do it myself um, is, is really like, that would be a huge value to me. So. Yeah. Well, and you can, you could like change what you're asking for on the fly instead of having to like file a new request. It's, it's that game that you were talking about, about how the better you understand the database and like the, the structure of it, the better you'll be able to ask questions, process, and like organize that information. Totally. I think like what I was trying to say before is that data is sort of strange. We, we, we see it and it doesn't always represent our understanding or our expertise, right? Like if you were to think about all of the data that you generate, if you saw it in an Excel spreadsheet, it might not be immediately apparent to you like how it actually relates to your life or your business. But the more you can leverage what you know about your business um, and your life with the data that you see, the, the faster you can get to using that data to, to do something in an informed way uh, and to share it with other people too. So um, yeah, this is, um, this is big. Mm -hmm. Yep. It, I think it was the hardest I've nerded out in a while. So, so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's great. All right, next up, who would like to share? I'll go really quick. I don't have okay. a lot. Um, I did uh, the Raspberry Pi exercise. Um, Corey helped me through all of it. Uh, and it was a lot of fun, actually. Um, not as uh, intimidating as I thought. I, I'm excited to learn a bit more. This world is like, again still like super new um so i think maybe when i feel more comfortable i want to um host some like i don't know retro games or something on it um i can't justify the price like to buy an actual console because i'm like i work too much but i could justify this raspberry pi because it's technically homework um yeah uh besides that um i like I'm going to start work. I got the green light from my client to start on the cloud project. So that's like official and I'm so excited. And yeah, it's like, thank you guys. <laughs> uh, I am so excited. Um, some slight modifications, but like nothing that I can't handle. Um, and I um, it's kind of blown my mind. Uh, so I'm like gonna start working on that. Um, and I think, I don't know how comfortable I can get with like servers and like this lesson like this was a lot this week I'm hoping that like I can have a good understanding enough to be able to make like an app on my own um but we will see that that's my that's my challenge for this week um and uh that's it yeah cool yeah getting getting into app inventor is is a hundred percent the recommended course for everybody because it's got tutorials it's approachable it is it is definitely a thing that can be done in a week so certainly go for that this week that's the plan 
All right, I saw Lila was waving and you wanna go for it? Sure, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh... Excellent, you were working on the carpet this week. That was, oh, that's so nice. So this is the uh, cement planter. And um, I was telling Corey that, so it, it came out pretty good. Um, I'll show you a picture. There's like one side where it kind of chipped and kind of stuck to the mold. I'm gonna try making another one. I need to clean out the mold, but it, it came out pretty neat. So I'm happy yeah. with it. Yeah. You could probably um, stand it. Then, um, I made these little zippered purses with the fabric that I sewed just for fun. And I am also working on the carpet and I could take it off the frame tomorrow. So, or even today, but I'm not going down there tonight. So that's what I worked on. And for the um, last week's assignment, I also, I sat with Corey and he kind of walked me through the whole thing and I forgot to take pictures and stuff or screenshots, but I went through it and I don't know what I'm going to do for this week. I might go to my friend Linda and see if she has any suggestions, but we'll see. All right. Yeah. I have a question about your planner, which I love. Um, sure. So, so like concrete is porous, right? So like would water naturally sort of like drain out of it? Like would it, would, you wouldn't even need to make a hole in the bottom, right? It might just like naturally drain. Okay, I didn't get, I was kind of thinking of that stuff later, like does it need to have a little cup in it? Because they do make yeah. concrete planters, so yeah. there is a little bit more research I need to put into how you actually would go about keeping a plant in one of these and what kind of plant. And Corey had sent me something about pH levels and soil, and it's just all this stuff to consider. And If you make another one, okay, just like pour some water in it. And let's just like, I would be curious if the water just came through it like slowly or quickly or. I can pour like, water in this one. I didn't plant anything in it. That's just like kind of. Ah, here, so I, I, like, I would be really excited about the results of that experiment. <laughs> yeah, I'm also, cause like, what if it rains? I also have questions, but it's also has this really smooth texture. Corey, is that cause of the plasticizer? Uh, the smooth, like it's got a smooth texture. I think cause you did that smoothing thing across its surface. I, it's just really soft, which I enjoy, but uh, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Like the, the concrete itself? Yeah, yes. It has a that's soft like, touch to it, rather than like huh. a rough concrete. Oh, yeah, I think that that's the plasticizer. So we just like poured a ton in and it got really magically soupy like plasticizer does. But it, I think that it, if it was a 3D print, you'd get all the 3D print ridges, but you did that smoothing stuff Right. So it's like really crisp really and clean. Soft. Yeah. It did, yeah. and I didn't take pictures. Yeah. So oh, I need to definitely it was, do another one and take pictures. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's totally worth doing because it's yeah. delightfully messy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it's, it looks like Ruby is saying a succulent would go well in there. Do you think? In, yeah, yeah, that they like the higher pH. Now I can see it. Yep. I thought drainage was like super important for succulents. Am I wrong? I, You're no, probably I right. You're probably right. I have killed uh, many uh, uh, succulents and cactuses. So perhaps you have a point. I don't know. I just got some and that's what it said was like, and I was completely confused because I've seen them in a lot of like cool containers like the one Lila made that I feel like don't have good drainage. And I'm like, are they just for show? And then once you buy them and take them home, they'll die. Um, I don't know. Did you just solve my my problem with my plants? This is like years of Did you figure out why they were dying. It's the cement planter. It's no drainage, duh. I killed I bamboo. I, I am not the person to ask. <laughs> but I want to go over to Bark and Vine and check in with them. Too many rocks, too little rocks, bad dirt. No, it's just, just drainage. <laughs> it's the most frequent thing that I run into when people are like, can you look at my plants and tell me what I'm doing wrong? I just put a finger in and you're like, yeah, you're like, you're waterboarding this poor plant. So <laughs> stop it. You know, the easiest thing that I do is just like, um, 
depending on the time of year, uh, if you just set a calendar reminder, so like in colder months where it's not as hot, like depending on the plant, obviously you might water it once a week, once every five days, but um, you know, you'll sort of get a feel for what makes sense, but being consistent is the thing that I've always struggled with. So of course I, I, uh, I automated it, <laughs> but you could just put it in the calendar. So, um, as, so one of the things we, we have a few things going forward in the future, but one of them is machine design, uh, a mechanism design machine building. I was, and those are group projects. I would be fascinated if one of our groups really went hard into machinifying a garden. I think that would be a neat group project for people. Machinifying could, a what? Sorry. Machine, like putting a machine together for gardening. Like these, like these plants, the ones that are here in Make Haven, like making it so they don't spill, doing machine things like that so that they do, you know, really nailing that would be a cool group project. I'd be down for that if, uh, if people wanted to team up to, yeah. to do something plant and garden related. Absolutely. Yeah, we can, we can get to that when we get to that. We'll get there. We'll get there. But um, yeah, cool. Let's see. We have Kate and Ileana. Ruby, was there something you wanted to add that you did that you didn't mention? I saw it in the chat, but I wasn't sure what oh. you meant. Oh, uh, I honestly don't have the language for it. I can I can describe it, but um, Corey like showed me how to using terminal and a server to show what your oh. phone was seeing on your computer, and you like it was it was freaky. Yeah, there's, I've got an app on my phone that'll turn my phone into a server so that it will serve what it sees out of its camera to a web page. So if I, so it'll local host a website that gets a video feed from my camera, which is, which is kind of wild. I can get it set up while I'll, I'll set it up in a minute. Kate, go ahead, if you want to go ahead and share. Uh, yeah, sure. I can share. Um, did anyone not do the hide and seek who wants to do it? Because it's there's a reveal in my blog post, so I can either like skip oh, it. Yeah. Or we, we can also can move it. We move can move it. where it is. It was very hard to find. May I just add? It Kate found it immediately. <laughs> what? Yeah. She like didn't make it to the 400. All right. Well, I will, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it and then and then I think we should move it because I I think we should move it every week. I think this should yeah. be like, every time you come and make Haven, the first thing you do is try to find it. Anyway, um, <laughs> all right, let's see if I can uh, share my screen, share the right thing, maybe. Um, oops, can we just share everything? Is that working? Yeah? Are we seeing? Um, okay, so. Um, so this, uh, with thanks to Aaron, this is. All right, let's give this a go. Me doing the hide and seek. That's lovely. That's awesome. That was like ridiculously fun. And in fairness, if it took you longer, I think I'm very familiar with the various blinks and lights in Make Haven. So I'm more likely to notice than most. Like, why is something blinking over there? Because that's part of my job. Um, so I did that. I really enjoyed that. Um, I would like to do more with it. But then I had a very kind of stressful week. So I mostly worked on other stuff. Um, I got so my blog post ended up being about kind of looking back where I, at that year mark kind of thing. And I was looking back, these were the first masks I made. I did not know how to sew at all. Um, and so it was, you know, I made, I got a new pattern and made some new masks this week with a new pattern that I really, really enjoyed. And so it was just a lot of me thinking about sort of this past year, but also 
the fact that the pandemic forced me to use the sewing machine that I'd had for years that I'd always been thinking about doing. Um, and so that's kind of what I was focusing on is the idea of making yourself do it and letting yourself do it badly and then doing it again and again and again, especially in the case of mass where I ended up making hundreds and learned a lot. But in the spirit of continuing to learn, I also just learned from my new pattern what pattern weights are and how they work. These are not your typical pattern weights, but they work. Um, and so I, I learned about that. The other new exciting thing that I learned was how to drill a hole into a bottle, which is something that I've been wanting to do with all of my glass work. You can see this is glue gun ring. And basically what that does is it makes a little pool of water around where you want to drill to keep everything wet and cool. It contains it on oh. the bottle and then it peels right off. It's one of those super smart things. I have a video, not super exciting. I learned a lot about clamps. Clamping glass is difficult. <laughs> I ended up working more with jigs. You can see that wasn't always successful, but I really did get some good results, which was really exciting because I tried it first with a Dremel and the diamond tip and it was very ineffective. I also had some that didn't work, but I have some other plans for those. So I'm gonna actually put these into the kiln this is just me learning about hooks in the kiln and, and flattening some stuff. Oh, and then speaking of room to grow, shall we say, I'm looking at trying to make a slumping mold and I am not a sculptor. And if you don't believe me, look at the screen. So my daughter grabbed some clay and made a lot of much cuter things than I did. But, you know, I was like, I'm just going to give it a shot. And so I'll, I'll update you on that. And then this is where a lot of my bottles ended up uh, when I was able to get them in. I hung a bunch on a tree in my backyard just as something to do. Let's see if this works. And it's just a happy little wind chime that makes me happy and very simple. So I'm gonna play more with this, but this is just my first attempt. Yeah, that's so that's so cool. Man, the how'd you how'd you end up clamping the bottle? Just like delicately doing it? No, the, the key is don't clamp the bottle. <laughs> so this is in my, okay. in my post, I kind of went through, you know, I had it in my head, all this, you know, you definitely want to clamp down your material, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're doing this work, you're down, your speeds are like 350, 360. So it's really not a lot of power. So what I ended up doing was clamping wood kind of to stop it in place and then mm. mostly holding the bottle. Um, which yeah. is which is not that difficult to do at that at that power level. I wouldn't try to do it. You know, if you if you see the video, I'm I move very slowly, and you know the the horsepower behind it is is not much. I think I would like you know, to probably um, make a, a jig at some point, but this is just learning. Yeah, my my like first thought, and this is more a knots thing than anything else, is you could get like a strip of fabric and wrap it around the bottle, and then twist the piece that isn't on the bottle so that it applies like a pressure onto that loop around the bottle. And it should apply a pretty even pressure across the surface as a way to do it. That, that might do a good job of like holding it at the very least, even if it's not like a clamp. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a cool idea. There's definitely a few things I wanna play with. And then also when I'm cutting glass, that's not a full bottle. Um, there's a few other shapes that I'm working with where I'm gonna have to probably construct something to make that work, but I'll give it a try. Cool. Man, we did so much. There's so many weird things that we do every week. I love it. Uh, did we, I think we lost, uh, I think we lost Juliana, bummer. Hopefully she's doing well. Um, I wanted to hear if the break's happening. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll message her, that'll be, it'll be good. So there are, it sounds like there's, Lots, lots of things that were done. This, oh, I was gonna show, let me share my screen really fast. I wanna show you the thing that Ruby was talking about. This is a neat trick. I was thinking I would do this when walking around Make Haven more, more than I have. So I'm gonna hit share here. This is, let me turn this on to browser. And so this is like the feed out of my, so maybe you can see that this is, this is my cell phone. So I'm, and I, you can't see that, what am I talking about? But uh, this is my cell phone feed that's able to be looked at so I can do this and carry it around. It's definitely got a lag, but
but it's a really cool way that my cell phone is now a web server. And if I go to the URL that is on the top of the browser, you know, like up over there in the browser up over there, um, that's my phone's IP address when I'm at Makehaven, but it means that I can walk around and show the HD video from my phone on screen here. And so it's a really interesting process that you can do if you wanted to get video off of the phone and onto another spot, just using it as a web server. So that's neat. Let me stop the share before this gets too weird. Stop the share. And that's with, what's the name of the app? Oh boy. IP, I think it's IP camera, like internet protocol camera. It's a neat trick. Uh, no, the IP is fine. My IP is, uh, yeah, that's, that's okay. If you can blur out a little region, could be good, but don't don't worry too much about it. Um, what was it called again? Internet Protocol. Um... IP Webcam Pro. That's, I think there's IP Webcam, which is free. I think I paid two dollars or something for the pro version. Mm -hmm. But IP Webcam, if you wanted to do that, it's. I've tried to use it in different ways. It's not super practical because there's so much lag, like seconds of lag but it but it's neat as like a way to be able to have a spy camera that you can staff somewhere real fast if you want no setup you just turn your phone on and do it yeah uh, if you want to be that sort of creepy i guess which it's, i've only ever used it for like this is the only time i've used it purposefully so yeah there's there's a ton of cool tricks you can do but just like you know, writing something like this, the I can IP webcam pro would be a pretty monumental task. But I mean, it's fundamentally, it's somebody who understood how to write a web app. They understood how to get the web app to host the server. And then that server is just outputting the video feed from the camera. And you go to the IP address and port on the phone so that you can get access to it. It's, it's local hosted. You'd only be able to get to it if you're on the same network. But it's like a it's a really fascinating technology trick. I thought I was gonna use it when you couldn't buy webcams for the pandemic. I thought I was gonna need that because you you couldn't buy one. Like they just they were either three hundred dollars or not available. Which is which is rough. Back in like April of last year. So yeah, there's there's tons of things. This this week, um, I just wanna highlight before any of us go away. This is a really deep end of the swimming pool. So do not feel like you need to understand all of it in any way. It's eat, like every single one of the slides, I can't iterate it, or I can't say enough. Those are all six figure degrees, six figure salary jobs. Like they're very big business. If you can do those on a professional level, there's many levels of nuance to all of them. Uh, and there's plenty of very established, well, you know, well uh, adorned developers who still like openly joke about how they don't know what Docker is, right? But it's, but it, you know, Kate, Kate has some experience with Docker, right? Yeah. I do, and I don't know what it is, but yeah. I used it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you're using Docker containers, and it's fascinating. The more, and, the more you learn, the, the, the better you are at, at describing how much you don't know. Oh, for sure. So there's like a, a perpetual imposter syndrome that that happens. Um, Dunning-Kruger, you're getting Dunning-Kruger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, it's the two guys who name the effects. Yeah. Of, of like the dip of, you know, like, yeah, yeah, it's a the Dunning Kruger effect. It's fascinating. So, mm -hmm. anyway, if if I can speak to the data stuff, that that side I know I know pretty well. That's why I'm I'm going whole hog on the API stuff. But if, if anyone ever wants to learn some of that, I'd be more than happy to to share some some pointers. I know that you had asked Ruby like about um, like the Microsoft language. Let's see. Let me go up a little bit. I don't know if, if I'll go through oh i'm sorry Did, were you were you still going i can no I can... no no it's just while you're it looked like it sounded like you were googling things i can put together a few steps for if you want to spin up a very simple node server like do this do this do this 
so that you can get a Hello World server up and running. Sure. So, so just uh, real quick, Ruby, you'd ask what language does Windows Server use? If we're talking about SQL Server, it uses SQL, the structured querying language that, uh, that Corey was talking about. Uh, the metaphor that I like to use is that we're actually using SQL all the time, the way that we think, um, particularly when we get food out of the refrigerator. So there's really like three parts to how a SQL statement is written. We have a, a select, so it's like I'm I'm pulling certain things like uh, you know bread, cheese, meat. Uh, we have a from, which is where that data lives. In this case, the fridge, um, and and the where clause, last piece is any conditionals that we might want. So we might say where the expiration date is greater than today. We don't want to, you know, pull something that's like rotten out of the fridge. So so there's ways to sort of see see the language making pretty pretty immediate sense. It's it's considered one of the easier languages to learn. So I just I just wanted to say that. That oh. analogy made it super clear. Thank you. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> I yeah. use it a lot. <laughs> I use it a lot. It's a good starting point. Food always works. Food food analogies and metaphors, like people are like, I get it. <laughs> yeah. That was the whole beginning of my blog post was like servers and apps just brings me to food. Like these are not things that I it's uh, yeah. I like fell down a rabbit hole of missing restaurants and then I was like, wait, coming back. <laughs> and when I don't get it, I just start stress eating. So it like it kind of makes sense on that level too. So uh, it, yeah. <laughs> I, I wish that there were better analogies for some of these. And I, I, the more I teach this, the more I'll come across them. Um, like your, your fridge one's fantastic. But, the, but having good ways to describe some of these ideas is tricky because they, they like were born by computers and they live only in computers. Totally. So the analogy for them isn't necessarily human friendly. Yeah. Uh, so which, I'm, I'm remembering from last week at, at some point you talked about, I think it was when you were talking about making an app, you talked about like, if you were able to make it just add and we're not going to subtract yeah. that, like that would be amazing. And so I'm, I'm yeah. hearing you say that made me feel like, whoa, this is really hard. <laughs> if, it's, it's gonna, if it's going to take me a, a week, like are all these ideas spinning in my head as they so often do way outside of scope because I don't know what I don't know, right? So do you have any examples, and maybe I should just go to the, the app builder and look like of, of a good starter thing to try to do? Yeah, the, and it, it was, I was saying that add and subtract would be good, but multiply and divide is probably harder than you'd expect. The, um, and forget square roots, but the, there are definitely tutorials on MIT App Inventor that will just walk you through, like, how do you make that cat app, the, the kitty per or whatever it was. They'll, they walk you straight through how to do it. You just follow their instructions. And there's, it, it takes a little while to get oriented even to the point where you understand, like, what is a reasonably, what is an approachable project for me to try and take on versus what is, what is going to be way harder than I think it will be. And, and so there's some, there's some nuance to that. Basically, if you could do it, like, it's weird to say, but my gut instinct is if you can do it without the internet, it's relatively easy. If you are using the internet to get a little bit of information, the tricky part would be how do you handshake with that source of information to get it? But at least we can identify that that will be the hard part. Um, and so those sorts of things can be really helpful. Uh, like Aaron was working with a lot of APIs and, and I think that fundamentally it was getting, how do you get authenticated and how do you have a secret and a key? What does that mean? Like some of those are really questions that you have to struggle with when you're trying to figure out that for something that's more complicated than NOAA. Like my tides one, I could know in advance, like, oh, this is a government body. They're going to give away this information. I just need to know how to interpret the format and then make a chart. So it was a relatively mine was a relatively easier api compared to some of the things that aaron took on because you had the extra layers of environment variables and, and authentications and keys to, to get it all to work so uh there's yeah it's under like if you ever feel like i want to do a thing feel free to send me a message and i'll float like is it a good idea or 
is it like tragically hard? Yeah, I think I'm gonna just start at the site and see a couple of examples before I let myself get too many ideas because yeah, then I'll yeah. just end up feeling like I failed in not good ways. Yeah, the, uh, so like ex the example I always give is I met this seventh grader who walked into my room and said, I want to build an RC car from scratch. And my thought was, oh, I'm sure you do, bud. <laughs> but he, and he meant like code and motors and the whole bit. But it's just such a, that's such a big task for a kid that's never done anything. Like it's, it's going to feel like you're failing for so long until you get somewhere. So like learning how to do those little things that lead up to the bigger skills is something that I've been musing about. And it's, it's like my secret back of my head summer project is to try and build something that helps people understand how to move through a series of projects to get you there. So this is, we're like, I think that might be my life, lifetime achievement award if I can figure out how to make it so that people can see that in advance of getting started with projects. That's my goal as a teacher, I think, on the education side. But it's hard. If you ever, like any time, just send me a message and I'll be like, that's, don't try. <laughs> or this is exactly right, do that. Or we can scale it. You know, if you want to make a, if you want a, like for the person who made the bowl that sent them a message, in my head, my very first thought is when it's empty, light up a light, no problem. Like that's one Arduino, it doesn't need to talk to anything. If you, and so if that would solve your problem, do that. If you want it to send you a message, now you've got many layers of connecting it to the internet, getting the internet messaging to work, having it send a message through Twilo like Aaron got to work. And so you have just more layers of things that you'd have to do a little sanity check of like, okay, I can have it send a message. I can have it tell if the bowl's empty. And then how do you connect to those two to each other? Like thinking about it in pieces. Yeah. But every little piece is, is another like, Tack on extra 10 hours, <laughs> you know? But yeah, 